and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. Coming to us from Solarian Games, the current heads of Top Secret New World Order. No wrestling jokes, please. The one and only Peter Bryant. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me, uh, Mildred. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, I had to preempt the no wrestling jokes because I know my audience. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. I I know at least I know at least one of them is going to bring it up. But if if you're going to make that joke, at least use at least use NWO Japan. <laughs> so, I usually open these things with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in my 50s at this point, so uh, I started role-playing somewhere around... It was the late 1980s, so so I'm gonna say somewhere in the October November time frame of 1980. And I remember that because I had moved up from Florida to to Baltimore to stay with one of my relatives, and um, my brother had come home from college the year before and was telling me about this thing he discovered in college called Dungeons and Dragons, and he um, told me about it, and I was like all excited, you know, I was like. Uh, let's see, I was uh, 10 years old, and, and, and I was, you know, well, at the time he was telling me I was 9. And then uh, when I got up to Baltimore, um, you know, I started my new life at a new school and all that, and I was walking past the, the, the local library, and they had a, a D&D group on Saturdays playing. So I, I went and I joined, and, and I've been playing ever since. Um, I think what stuck with me is, is I, w I had always been... You know, a kid with a big imagination, head in the clouds, and um, you know, I, I liked telling stories, and it was just sort of a natural fit. Now, mind you, I was early in that telling story, so I wasn't good at telling stories just yet, but I really liked being part of the storytelling process, and I and I kind of cut my teeth um, with a with an, a, a little bit of an older group, and it and it. <laughs> It was a little, uh, it was a little rough at first because you know here I am, this this young kid showing up to uh, to a game with all these teenagers playing. So I, I kind of caught the butt into things quite a bit, but it, it didn't matter. I was determined, um, and and I played with that group for a while, and then uh, went on to start my own group with my own friends. Mm -hmm. And would would it be fair of me to say that you had jumped around between systems quite a bit over the years? Oh, yeah, that would be pretty fair to say. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've played all kinds of stuff. So, with so with that in mind, um, obviously Top Secret is a was a venerated name through the T, through the TSR era, which is why I um wanted to cover it when I was doing TSR when I was doing TSR month alongside stuff like Dragonlance Fifth Age and basically every Everything TSR that wasn't D and D was on was on the proverbial table, and with from your perspective, what would you say is the appeal of spy fiction? You know, it's it's a it's an interesting genre in that um, there's you know it's not you don't have straight up fights you don't like. You know, go on. You don't. You're, you're not some kind of mercenary. I mean, I guess you could be in a spy game, but you know, if we're talking about top secret type spy game where you're the actual spy, um, so, so you're not like taking jobs and trying to make money by you know just killing and looting and all that kind of stuff. Um, you have to think about what you're doing. You get faced with real world. You know, some real world challenges, some a little bigger than real world, but you know, generally there's nothing supernatural. You know, you just you gotta you kind of gotta live by your wits. And um, you gotta be a little bit of a sleuth, you know, solve some mysteries, um, and you can't just, you know, hack your way through that stuff. You know, most of the time in a in a spy genre mission, if if you go in just kicking in doors and shooting people, you generally tend to fail the mission. And um, mm -hmm. so I think I think that's kind of the appeal. It's a it, you have to think about 
gaming a different way. You have to be very, very crafty, very creative. Um, you know, and and even though there are some fights and action and stuff like that, generally in a spy game, um, the the less number of fights you get in, generally the better for your success on a mission. Yeah. Well, something I find amusing is that in is that in the last fifty years we've had two major boom periods when it comes to spy fiction in um, po in popular media. The first one was all the way back in the seventies. Uh, you know, you ha you obviously you had Bond, you had the Man from Uncle, even Doctor Who leaned a little bit into the spy thing around that time, and then ag then we had it again in the early two thousands. Yeah, yeah, it, and it, and it was it was always present in between those two periods, and um, but but it was always it was always kind of there, but not as you know right, not as big. Um, like it wasn't part of your big bump, but it never really went away, which is kind of interesting, um, you know, because there's a lot of genres that almost like almost all but disappear between their their highlights. Um, and then I would also, you know, think that you're talking about you know American pop culture. Uh, the British have always been more spy oriented than than the U.S. I think a lot a lot of British spy shows. You know, you had the Avengers came out of Britain. You had um, I don't know, there's a whole slew of them. I don't. Even, I'm not as familiar with uh, British TV. One, one of my my uh, co-owners is Solarian, uh, Jason. He is he is very much into the spy genre, the British spy genre. He keeps telling me about this this show called Sandbaggers, and he said that's like the greatest spy show ever. And I think that was a show from the '60s or '70s. Um, but yeah, yeah, you had two two big jumps, and then kind of a just a steady slow crawl in the middle. Yeah. And like I said, the the Pertwee era of um, Doctor Who kind of leaned into a little bit of um, a little bit of spy th themes around that time. So, so you definitely have you definitely have that, and I've always ha I've always had this approach this approach of treating spot treating different forms of spy fiction as part of as part of two ends of a pendulum. Um. What I, what I call what I call the Bond end and the Born end. The the Bond end is the more is the more larger than life and almost comic book or pulp like approach, whereas the Born end is try is trying to go for I don't want to say realism because that's overused. I'll go with believability, and ten, tends to rely a lot more on grit. Oh. Yeah, and if I want to be cynical, a lot more on shaky cam, but that's another that's another story. You're right, right? Yeah, you know that that's um that's interesting. I haven't thought about it like that, but that's true. That's absolutely true, and and it, it would it explains why I tend to like the the born the born end of the pendulum uh, more so than the Bond end of the pendulum. I mean, you know, believe it or not, I'm not really like a big Bond guy. Bond is okay. I don't have anything against him. And I don't have anything against the movies; they're fine. Um, you know, I'll, I'll go on record saying that uh, the Connery was my favorite, but I've really been liking Daniel Craig um, as his role as Bond. But again, not not the biggest Bond fan. I'm a real big Bourne fan, love Bourne. Um, you know, and I do like the Mission Impossible series. I think that's I think that's been pretty decent. Um, and then uh, you know. And I'll say it, I liked the, the, the original two Charlie's Angels movies with uh, uh, Cameron Diaz and, um, you know, I uh, uh, can't think of their name, um, the, the other two actresses, mm -hmm. damn it, I can't think of their names right this second, off the top of my head, but uh, I did like those, those were fun, but I mean, those were goofy, you know, they're, they're like, like you said, they're like on the other end of the spectrum, um, they're definitely, you know, out there, but they were fun. Yeah, and... Well, when it comes to, when it comes to Daniel Craig's run run with Bond, um, I look at I look at a large amount of that as just as really bad timing because right as it was starting to get momentum, the writer strike happened and everything everything kind of went to hell afterwards. Right. Um, and it is fun, it is funny that you mention um, some of the ones that you mentioned because there is a bit of an asterisk that we have to put in when it comes to Mission Impossible. Because from 
I'd say Ghost Protocol to now, it's kind of it, it it's kind of a soft reboot for itself. Um, uh, and as far as Born, well, I I liked the fir- I liked the first couple of Borns, then the shaky cam problems started to happen, and I can and I it kind of lost me. Right. Um. Yeah, but that's the first Born is amazing. That is a one. That is a hell of a movie. I would say I would. When I when I look back at when I look back at some of the int- when I look back at some of these spy films that that you and I have discussed in the last few minutes, um, there's some that I think have a stronger premise for a ro- for a role playing game um, session than others. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd say the the original born identity of so- of somebody who's an assassin but doesn't quite um, know why they are is of is a very strong is a very strong use of that you might have to be, get a little bit creative with with say selective memory if you're bringing in a whole party but it's doable um, and that that does bring me to one of the other issues when it comes to doing spy fiction is that with a lot of the films that we've talked about whether it be bond whether it be born whether it be whether it be whether it be mission impossible I'm putting Charlie's Angels off to the side because that's a special case. Okay. But you'll notice all of them are focused on a singular spy. Right. And you can do duets in role-playing games, but <laughs> it comes with a whole lot of asterisks. Mm-hmm. It's because it most... Unless they're, unless they're specifically built for it, and that list is very, very small, relatively speaking... Most are going to be built around a party, and I think the big I think the big question, just from a design standpoint, is how is how do you accommodate the idea that you're going to be doing a party in something like spy fiction? Right. Okay. So that's that's one of the the kind of shining points behind the the, the core design of, of Top Secret, of this latest version, mm-hmm. uh, in that you don't have a whole lot of skills in um, in Top Secret. You have your trade crafts, you know, and there's four trade crafts, mm-hmm. and each person, you only have so many points that you can be really good in any one of those. Um, and then you, you know, you kind of boil it down to kind of good in two and then not great in one. And that's the way the system is set up. And the beauty of that is, is that it forces diversity in the party, diversity of, of capabilities in the party. Um, so you really have to rely on on each person's talent. Um, there's, you know, you couldn't play a James Bond like character in Top Secret until I don't know your character had to be super super experienced. Like you'd have to play that character for quite a long time. Or if you're administrator, as we call him, that's the game master in Top Secret. If, if the administrator decides that he's you know, going to run some super high-level campaign where everybody has a lot of points, um, then you know, then everybody's playing like a Bond. And that, to me, that doesn't seem fun. So that that's one of the things that we did. And and the beauty of, of having the four trade crafts, and then there's specialties under the trade crafts, but if you have a trade craft, you can do any skill fairly well within that trade craft, as long as your attribute supports it, your, your, your good attributes support it. Um, but the, the beauty of that is that you have a wide variety of things you can do within that trade craft. So it, it enhances the ability to have a party of people um, without a whole bunch of overlap and everyone having to kind of lean on each other for their capabilities. It's funny you mentioned that when it comes to trade craft, uh, because it addresses an issue that I've had with how a lot of game designers handled skill systems. This was especially this was especially offensive in in the '90s, but it's since been okay. dialed back. Right. And you you probably saw it too of a lot of designers having this boner for having as many skills to ac- as many individual skills as humanly possible, but still under the same pool of adv- of advancement. So you can't really have a jack of of many trades, and it's starting no. to get ridiculous. Um, Fantasy Games Unlimited is my whipping boy with this kind of thing. <laughs> right. It's, when you have too many skills like that, the, 
All right, so this is what you generate when you, ha when you do that, right? So if you have that wide open number of skills, then you have to give people a lot of skill points or else they're, you know, they're going to die at some simple task they should be able to do. Like, oh, you don't have the climbing skills. It's like, well, you know, I have like 50 skills on my character sheet. I just didn't have the points to also buy that. Oh, well, I guess you're going to die because you can't climb down this thing that you need to climb down, right? I mean, it, it leads to that sort of stuff. Uh, you know, not always, but, but generally. And then because of that, you wind up having everybody, you know, they, they quickly recognize the most important skills to have, and that's what they focus on. And so you wind up with a party of, you know, let's say you have five players, right? You have, a, you have five players who are slightly different than one another. You know what I mean? Because they spend all their points on the skills they know they're going to need to, to get through an adventure, but then they all have the same damn skills. So, you know, you wind up with pretty much the same the same characters. So, yeah, that that giant, you know, bath of skills that you have to buy kind of turns me off. And and I also I also like the idea of pooling skills together. So you, you, you take like a category of skills and maybe you have like, you know, there's a basis, a base number for that or something, you know, so that all the skills underneath of it are all very complementary or very, um, you know, you're, you're kind of, you're, I'm good at these things, but I'm especially good at like this one, this one, and this one. But uh, you know, I'll give you an example. So like like the games that, that, that'll have like axe as a skill and sword as a skill and hammer as a skill. Um, you know, my thoughts on that, and, and I, I studied martial arts for a number of years, so that's a completely ridiculous way to look at skills for, for melee or any kind of, you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat. Um, are you going to tell me that, uh, you know, I can be an expert with an axe and I can't use a hammer at all because I don't I didn't spend skill points on that? That's ridiculous. You know, when, you, you when swing I, them the same way. Even with that, when I, when, when I, had, stu when I had studied... Um, because I, because I, when I, I, it was, you had the unarmed, you had the unarmed stuff, but I was also studying with a staff, with, with Kama, with, with Tan, with Tanfas, with Nunchaku, all in the same gen, all in the same general class. Mm hmm Yep. But it's not, it's not like, it isn't, isn't like somebody who's study, who's studying a particular martial arts style is studying just how to punch or ju or just how to kick. You're studying right. how to kick, you're studying how to punch, you're studying how to grapple, how to how to block all all these things. And I I look at that kind of thing as an an artifact of the early days of role playing. Sure. You have sure, a lot sure. of you have a lot and I I don't mean this in any disrespectful manner. This is just me assessing what what I what has been observable. You have you had a lot of co you had a lot of college um, nerds essentially who probably didn't probably didn't have a um, good understanding of fighting. Yep. Um, or they got their ideas from movies or books that they read, but they hadn't actually. Many of them may not have given, sat in a classroom and actually had to spar with people. Given how a lot of given how a lot of the early days of role playing were a descendant from the um, wargaming scene of the se of the seventies, I would venture to say that it's a lot of people who probably read books on particular wars, but not on the f not on the personal fighting tactics of a given conflict, whether it be the Napoleonic conflict, whether it be um, and whether it be the Civil War, whether it be and whether it be either of the World Wars. You get the idea. Sure, sure. And, and, and let's be fair, you know, a lot of these early games, um, they were expanding out and they were trying new things. And, you know, maybe it just the, the, the concepts that we have today, you know, we're, we're taking a lot of this for granted because, you know, we're, we're standing on the shoulders of giants, as they say, right? Mm -hmm. we, we have the benefit of, of not making the mistakes that some of them made. And there's also like a style of play. Some people may like that style. And again, I'm not dogging that. I'm, I'm one of those, I'm one of those folks. You know, people say, "Hey, uh, what, what? Are, give me a list of bad games." I'm like, "Well, you know, in my, in my opinion, there are very few games I would call bad. I would rarely ever call a game bad. I mean, a game would have to be really, well, yeah, right, fatal. Okay, that, that's fair. Uh, a game would have to be, like, you know, 
objectively terrible for me to give it a bad uh, a bad rap because sometimes it's just a matter of how certain people like to play you know if if you want to play with all them skills because in, in your opinion that's you know how things should be divided up and you all have fun at the table doing that great that's it to me that that's a great system because you know you're happy you're playing it that's that's fine um but yeah when we're talking about just the you know the, the concepts of what makes the most sense and and you know in a more realistic sense not that you know not that anything of our characters do is realistic really this is, this but, is why i use the term believable believable right let's do that i'll do that so you know if, if you want something that's a little more believable then you start getting into some of the stuff that we see you know post i want to say post 90s post 95 96 when you start getting into there you start getting into stuff that's a little more um a little more freeform, you know, you're getting into your more modern games, and, like, people are coming up with some really crafty stuff, and crafty ways to to simulate the stuff that's going on without having to be super granular. You know, and, and I think that was the, it's kind of like the 80s mantra, right? Mm-hmm. 80s and early 90s, you know, let's make this as, as granular as possible. You had, you know, games like Time Lords and, and Phoenix Command. and Oh, God, uh, Phoenix and, Command. Yeah. Right, right, right. So, you know, games such as that where, where it just it got really super granular and you had to look up charts and, you know, let me roll on this chart to see, you know. Um, I remember the one game we played, Millennium's End, um, and, and I liked the game. It was fun at the time, right? But it had like these hit charts, right? So if you if you shot at somebody, and um, and you, you, let's say you missed by a point or two, you would lay this chart over a silhouette, and you could still hit them. You know, I was aiming for the head, but I missed by three, and, and you go, oh well, you hit him in the neck anyway. It's like it was just this whole thing, and they had all these silhouettes. Sounds like you played it. All these silhouettes and all these charts. And, you know, it's like, oh, the guy's laying on the ground. All right, let me lay the thing over top of him now. And, okay, yeah, yeah, you hit him in the back of his foot. Wow, look at that. You know, and it was just, it was interesting, but in my opinion, just not, it's just not fun. It takes forever. It doesn't flow. You know, you get in one combat at your whole evening. Time for that, you know. Um, that's, that's not how I like playing. Yeah, this is the reason why I have the mantra of believability over realism. Mm-hmm. Because of, because of the fact that, um, like with just using just using those random hit location charts, um, you will you will inevitably end up with a situation that stretches credulity. Mm-hmm. Like say you're swinging at somebody with a knife and somehow you end up hitting them in the foot. Right now, right. But you're both standing up, and like, how did that happen? Now, if you were sh- if you were shooting at them and you shot them in the foot, okay, fine. Um, I'm, it's going to be a little bit of a stretch if you're shooting somebody with a nine mil at point blank range and you somehow end up shooting them in the foot. Right. <laughs> but... And then I get to the whole other thing that was that was big. I saw it, you know, come about in the '80s and, and again into the '90s, and then you kind of start to see it fade away. Or, or these area hits, you know, you can do them, and they and you know, depending on how you how a game implements that, um, I think area hits are very, they're very hard to get right in a game, you know, because it can tend to bog things down, it can tend to make things very, you know, really just kind of difficult at the table, and it really slows down the momentum. Um, not to say that they all do that, you know, uh, done well, it's, it's actually kind of cool, but it's it's a hard that is a really hard thing to tackle if you decide hey I want to have area I want to play a game that has area hits or I want to put area hits in a game that that I'm making um, you have to be very careful with that like like I have found because I've made a few games in my time and um, yeah area hit was always you know it was kind of iffy whether I whether I decided to keep it or not because I'd be like this is really cool I mean the fact that I can you know hit somebody in the in the chest and, and they're likely to die or hit him in the arm and they'll probably survive. Um, but then, you know, it's like, oh, roll your, roll your hit. All right, roll your damage. Now, where did you hit? Do you have armor there? Uh, I'm buying armor. Okay, well, you got armor here, 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 and here, but not here and here. I don't know. You know what I mean? It's, it's just, it's a lot. Yeah, that, the, this is the reason why when, pe- when people talk about adding more realism to, 
adding more realism or, sim or simulation to their particular games. Um, I look at it like a pendulum. Like a little bit of simulation, okay, a, a little too little simulation, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, it's it's gonna be hard to connect. I can see, I can certainly see that. That right. this is where the superhero argument can come in, even though I find that a bit exaggerated. Um, but, like I said, it's a pendulum. You can swing it too far the other way, where you have to do stats for things so for things so ridiculous. It's, I'm getting um, Vietnam flashbacks to playing the campaign for North Africa again, where my where the Italians are penalized if their if their pasta isn't properly cooked. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm not well, sure if you. Just... I'm not sure if you've ever seen the campaign for North Africa's board, but that is only a slight exaggeration. Is that the one that takes like hours to set up and, and can take like days to run? Is is that the one? Yeah, it's, it's, the, it's, the one, it's the one where the board is larger than a small child. Right, 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 right. Yeah, um, and, and and another aspect to you know your your more complex or more granular game versus your more simplistic or, or story you know story driven type of game um, is the 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 ability to keep a campaign going for a long period of time and have people stay interested um, you know because because if you're on the if you're on the the easier end you know you're you're more you're smoother. Uh, less complicated system. That means it it has less in it, right? Because it has to. If it's going to be easier, it's it's got to have less stuff in it. Because the more stuff you add, the harder you make it. You make it more complex. Um, but if it gets too much, you get too far. Um, you risk not being able to run any kind of long campaigns if you wanted to, because people, you know, they'll kind of get bored. There's not a whole lot you can do with the character because there's not a whole lot there. Um, we we found that many times. Uh, I would say like of Savage Worlds mm. to play, but it's not a game that I've ever been able to run any long campaign in. You know, once we get twenty games in, we kind of like hit the ceiling on you know what we're going to do with our characters, uh, and them, and they also you know they level up at that point so so powerful that they're like unstoppable, um, which isn't you know. That's not very much fun either. You gotta have some challenges, um, but but uh, but I do like Savage Worlds. It's just I think it's good for short campaigns. But at the same time, like you were saying, if you have a super complicated system, people will burn out. Like you can't run a super long campaign on that either, because after a while you're just gonna be like, oh, I'm so tired of calculating all the weight that I'm carrying so that I can get my encumbrance, so that that hike that we did will knock off my endurance. And then, oh, we already got heat, and we didn't have enough water, so I'm losing two more endurance points. And then that's going to affect me with a plus three modifier, which is, uh, that's going to be 15% based upon this skill level. You know, and after that, you're just like, oh my god, playing this game's like a job. <laughs> yeah. So you got to find that, that delicate uh, middle point. And then, and of course, at, you know, as I've said before, and I'm sure you agree, it's also up to the players. So if you have a playing group that really loves all that, you know, crunchy, nutty, you know, granular stuff, then then go for it. Maybe that's that's great for you. Um, I'm just I'm speaking in generalities. I generally tend to find that, you know, the majority of people kind of tend towards somewhere in the middle. Um, you have your players who like the just the story driven. You know, like there are people who like uh, who, who really like like diceless games where you just kind of write your character up with you know some concepts and then that's what you play um I, that wouldn't maintain me for very long but there are plenty of people that it does and you know if they like it then great that's cool yep and with that with that in mind i will i will note this and this may sound a bit odd but the one film that i use as as a template whenever whenever i'm Whenever I'm doing a um, spy fiction campaign with a full mm -hmm. party, isn't technically speaking a spy, a spy fiction movie. It's Ocean's Eleven. Okay, that's fair. Yeah, I mean it's it's similar to the genre. I mean it, it's very close. I'm specifically referring to the remake we we got in um, 2000. -ish. Right, right. George Clooney and and uh, with Brad Pitt and yeah. I can't remember who else was in that. Yeah, but yeah, that was a that was a really good movie, and yeah, I think um, I think some of your your heist type movies, 
uh, can qualify in the play style. You know, it's it's you're right. It's not a spy. It's not spy genre, but all the same elements are there: sneaking around, deception. Um, you know, breaking in without being seen. You know, there's really it. It has all the same feel to it. It's just with a different goal. And the, the the end goal of the characters is just different. But other than that, they're doing all the same stuff. Yeah, the big reason I bring up Ocean's Eleven in this is you don't really have anybody who's a jack of all trades. You have you have right. you have people who are grifters. You've got people who are wheelmen. You've got people who are hackers. You've got people who are who are gonna be infiltrators. You've you're gonna have people whose bit whose big thing is BNE. Um, you have a bunch of different. Instead of having a bunch of um generalists, you have different r different niches that are going to be fulfilled through different players. Yeah, yeah, and you know you can you can do those kind of games with a spy game. So let's say you wanted to play a party of professional thieves. You like you're a you're a crew, and you and you do jobs, and um. You know that's that's the the setting you want to run in. You you know you want that's you're you're gonna run the game. You see you're the you're the game master and you pulled all your friends together and you're like, hey, we're gonna run this series of adventures and I want you guys to be like these high level, um, you know, like burglars or, or high level thieves, and um, we're gonna use top secret to do that. Mm -hmm. Totally could do it. You could totally do it. Yeah, it would work great. It would actually it would actually work really well. Uh, one, one, one of the things I would love to do, and when I was watching the movie, I was like, oh my god, this is like a movie version of, of Top Secret, was uh, Six Underground with uh, Ryan Reynolds. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that? I think I, ha I, think I have, but it, may have, but it may have been a while. Yeah, it was a little while. It was a couple years ago. But it was, uh, I think it was, it was a Netflix show, I'm, I'm pretty sure. But that was that was really awesome movie. It was a lot of fun. And, um, that would fit the rules and the and and the way characters are built for Top Secret, although they weren't spies. Mm -hmm. And th that's that's the other thing. Even even though um, Top Secret New World Order has the has the um, default setting built around being agents of Icon. Um, that can take a that can take a lot of forms. Not everybody is going to be doing the um, uber spy uber spy approach. In fact, I'd say most wouldn't. They're gonna you're gonna have a bunch of specialists ha having to work together on one particular mission. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and and you know, different people run Top Secret in their own way. You know, um, one of the things that we you know we we didn't spend a lot of time on because I. You know, we had this. We had a lot of intentions, right? And we're just starting to realize some of that stuff now. Real, realize those intentions that we had back then. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I can go into it in a little bit. Uh, I won't do it right this second because I'll, you know, get to this point. But um, you know, like Solarian has had some growing pains, and we're getting in a really good place right now. But we don't. We, had, you know, we'd always had the intention of doing more stuff with like world building and. Uh, administrator tools and stuff because I think one of the things that that the top secret currently lacks um, and it's something I'm working with some folks to fix right now is the the tools for people to run the game and generate adventures um, I think that's the I think that's the hardest thing for folks when they get you know when they get the game and they get the books to go through it it's like okay great I got all these rules I can make characters or spies how do I make an adventure in this setting with these rules? And we haven't provided a whole lot of that. I mean, there's some in there, and you know, if you're a great, you're, you're great with role-playing games, got a lot of experience and stuff, shouldn't be too much of a problem. But I do find that people struggle with that quite a bit. So one of the things I've been doing, you know, in in, in between like writing, you know, modules and and um, supporting, you know, the folks out in the community, uh, I've been been developing some behind the scenes stuff for uh, for administrators and and there's a guy uh, Scott Congable he's one of our what we call our super fans and we're starting to bring him in as a as a writer and a developer to help develop some of the material he's created into products for people but he's been spending a lot of time thinking about you know what are the motivations what kind of adventures would there be where does icon get involved what don't they do um, cuz it gets kind of tricky right icon is not run by a government it's this 
non-government agency that does quote unquote good in the world and that's most of what you're left with and, and what does that mean you know what do they interfere with what what does good look like what you know wh where do they step in and help things or stop things or hurt things or you know they're they're not into nation building they're not going to do that um they're not going to they're not assassins they're not going to be assassinating people so so what do they do right and i think that's something we need to to work on getting into people's hands more is that kind of information and it's something i've been working on i've got a document i've started developing you know that, that lays out okay here's the kind of missions that you would run as icon these are the, these are ways that icon would get involved this is why they would care you know and then when i'm when i'm done with this and we can release it and i'm going to work with scott and the other guys at solarian and stuff um and again this is not a book announcement this is just something i've been working on i don't know when it's going to be done i don't know what it's going to look like when it's finished but we have been working on it and jason's been working on some world building stuff as well um but we do want to put some of this material out soon so you know some of it may come out in like free beta rules or something we've been looking at a creating like a download page for that but at any rate the point of the matter is is that these will be tools that will help you figure out how to craft an adventure uh, you know, running it with Icon as your background. But, you know, back to our earlier point, you could run it any way you want to. I mean, you could do any kind of adventures you want. You don't have to be a part of Icon. Mm -hmm. um, you know, do what you want with it. The, you know, it's your game. You buy it. You can do whatever you want. But, um, but yeah, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's set up for all kinds of stuff like that. Yeah. Now, speaking of that, it's quite a, it's quite a departure going from top secret SI to New, to New World Order since SI was doing the percentile die like a lot of games were around that time, mm -hmm. whereas New World Order is doing the Lucky 13 system, this uh, multiple die size approach just with a rule of 13 when it comes to what you're going to be ro when it comes to what you're going to be shooting for. Mm -hmm. um, what can you tell me about how the Lucky 13 system came to be? Okay, so yeah, that was um. It was primarily James Carpio. So it's 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 me, Peter Bryant, um, uh, Jason Elliott, and James Carpio were the three you know uh, uh, owners of Solarian. Um, so this the Lucky Thirteen was James's idea, and it, it came from. Uh, he'll tell you he he doesn't like doing a lot of math, and he likes to keep things easy. Um, the idea behind Lucky Thirteen was that you you know you always have a number that you have to roll to, which is thirteen, um, and instead of adding things up. Like, you know, well, plus one for this and minus one for that. And then, you know, you got a skill bonus here, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's basically you, you, you have a, a die for your attribute. You have a die for your trade craft. So trade craft is like, for those of you who don't know, trade craft is like a, like a really high level skill. Like one of the trade crafts is combat, right? So anytime you get into combat and it, it also kind of like covers certain things like driving and some of the high action skills probably could have called it action, but whatever it's called combat um so then you know so you get your two dice so for example you got reflex and combat so you'd take those two dice so if your reflexes was a a d8 and your combat was a d10 you'd roll a d8 and a d10 and in the third die that is always your situational die um we've been calling it your asset die but one of the things that we've discovered in the years that we've been playing it and talking with folks um we're gonna start moving away from from uh, having it as so much as an asset die, it'll be, it's more likely going to be a situational die, which will be determined by the game master. And then if you have an asset, it can modify that die. And again, we're not like adding one or minusing one or whatever. It's just like, okay, you get to step your die up or step your die down. So if it was a D8 and you stepped it up, it'd be a D10. Mm -hmm. If you stepped it down, it'd be a D6. And then that way you just roll those three dice, you add them together, 13, great, you made it. Less than thirteen, you failed. So it keeps it super simple. And at, at least with this set, at least with this setup, the D twelve isn't as lonely as it's been cursed to be. <laughs> yeah, D twelve is actually my favorite die. Yeah, I, I keep hear I keep hearing a lot of people talk talk about their love for the D twelve, but that, but when in so many games that die just gets over that like, gets overlooked or gets barely used. Yeah, that's true. You're right. It does. We did play. I did play a game one time, and I, I have to find the name of it for you. Um, I can't remember what the hell the name of it was, but it was this game that only used D12s, but it like did them as pools. It was a lot of fun. 
But yeah, for the most part, though, D12 gets, you know, that's probably the least used die. Uh, maybe D4? No, D4. I see people using D4. Um, I know, I know that a certain, I know that a certain roommate of mine would lo would love it if I not use D four ever again after my little stunt. <laughs> what did you do? Did you lay a bunch of mat on the floor? Um. <laughs> I rigged, I rigged several pounds of D four on the kitchen floor. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> to keep nice. him from midnight snacking, I. I got I got like four or five pounds of D four and just and just spray just late just laid them all out on the kit on the kitchen floor. They're all white, and on white tiles. Hey, you, you want to play a good practical joke on him? What you do is you take his fitted sheet off, put all your D fours down, and then put the fitted sheet over top of it. Because of the how many there would be, wouldn't even notice it. Go to roll into bed. Um, I did that with Legos once. Oh, nice, nice. Oh, I, well, that that and I've get I've I've mentioned this plenty of times on the show, but I've developed a reputation as being the worst kind of prankster. Um, mm -hmm. I'm I'm the type of person who would bi who would build a remote control air horn and hide the speaker behind the toilet. Nice, nice. <laughs> you know, they go in, they're about to take care of their business. They hear the air horn noise, they run out screaming. Yeah, yep, nice. Oh, I set up some lawn signs that said free t-shirts, turn right, just to make people drive in circles. <laughs> okay. Oh, I, I had done the, I had done the, when, when, um, when everybody's computers still had CD trays, I did, I did the whole thing of putting in a program so that the disc tray opened every 90 seconds. Nice. No, that didn't do anything, um, Dr didn't do anything drastic or evil or anything like that. It ju it's just there to um, trigger people's OCD. Okay. Because you can just leave it open, but nobody's ever going to do that. No. Um, Damn thing, why do you keep opening? Yeah, you, then, then you close the thing, and then 90 seconds later it opens right back up. <laughs> hmm. uh, and I, d I had... Um, s I had rigged the I'd rigged the carpet I'd rigged the carpet floor with camouflaged mouse traps. Peace. So a little evil there. Um, you ever hear the saying that revenge is a dish best served cold? Yes. Um, and well, one of my masterpieces. A friend of mine asked me to make him a louder alarm clock, so I I rigged his alarm clock so it ha so it was replaced with the drowning music from. Genesis era Sonic the Hedgehog. Okay, I'll no, do it. You're not going back to sleep after that. No. Oh, might have helped him. Well, he 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 told me he didn't care about how I did it. He just wanted to he just wanted to be louder. Yeah, yeah. So can't get so, mad. No, no, <laughs> it's true. So you were saying before when we when we first started uh, prior to like prior to us actually recording, you had mentioned that um, that there was a big difference between the the one point and the, the the most recent version which I sent you for review. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. We um, we caught some errors um, by some, quite a few, mm -hmm. and uh, we've been trying to fix those over the years. And uh, one of the things that we're uh, planning to do, we got this Kickstarter that we just finished up. Well, not finished up. We finished running it. We're now uh, fulfilling it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I believe we're going to have... We might even have all the printed stuff back from the printers in the next two weeks. Uh, that's no promise, but I, we, we might be. it might be that soon. Yeah. But at, at any rate, um, once that gets all finished up and we got you know we got our feet back under us, um, one of the things we're going to uh, try and make sure that we do is get all the people who backed the original... Um, Top Secret Kickstarter back in, what was it, 2017, I think, or something, um, get that copy out to all of them so they so that everybody who's bought the game um, that we can know of, that we can reach out to, will have the absolute latest version with all of the fixes in it that we, we've got to date. Mm -hmm. I will note, I was I was not one of the backers. Um, mm -hmm. I, ended up coming, I ended up coming into Top Secret New World Order late. Um, okay. Be by the time by the time I caught wind of it, it was it was already out in di in digital form. Um, sure. And 
Well, the big the big reason I I used that when I did TSR month a few years ago was be, was because of the fact that I felt I would be double. I was already I was already covering um, Marvel Phase Rip in that, and mm -hmm. covering two games that use a roll under D one hundred system would have felt a little bit redundant. Yeah. Okay. That's fair. Uh, and well, bet between the two. Oh, Marvel face rip was going was going to be was going to be the big was going to be the bigger um target. <laughs> that's that's not to that's not to diminish top secret or SI. It's ju it's yeah. just um your one it's just which one had the which one is going to have the bigger impact as a historian. Um, oh sure sure I, you know I would I would have to say Marvel uh the Marvel face rip system was was very popular in its time and. And you can see that in the fact that it's still popular. You know, there's a bunch of. Um, Are you familiar with the site Classic Marvel Forever? I believe so. I want to. I want to say yes. I'm not 100 percent sure, but but I've seen a lot of these sites. Classic Marvel Forever is a, is a site that is just a treasure trove of mater of material for the for the for uh, Marvel face rip. <laughs> like there's there's enough. There's enough there where you could where you could have you could have um, unique material for years. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Um, I have um I have a buddy of mine, and and I'm gonna look this up while we talk real quick because I want to give him a, a little bit of a shout out since we're talking about face rip. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I think it's is it G Core. G Core, yes, okay, G Core, okay. So a buddy of mine, it, it, his name is is Jay Libby. He uh, he runs Dilly Green Bean Games, and um, he created a system called G Core, which is uh, basically like um, oh, yeah. a retro clone. Yeah, I'm familiar with G Core. Okay, yeah. So that that's one of my good friends, Jay, who who, who made that, and uh, he's put out like a ton, a ton of material for it. He he loved Face Rift. I think that was his first. I I want to say that was his introduction to role playing. I think. But he's also a giant Marvel fan, giant comic book fan, like just just loves it to death. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the th one of the th one of the things that I'm cu that I'm curious about because you know how we mentioned the bo the Bond and Born pendulum. <laughs> um, I think it I think it's important with something like Top Secret to n to nail down wit to nail down where it particularly lands because. Obviously, this isn't the only game in town when it comes to doing spy fiction in a role-playing sense, and none of them are going to be taking the taking the same approach. Right now, you do have a bit. You do have a bibliography um, in the in the back end of the book, but in your opinion, where would Top Secret New World Order um, land within that within that pendulum? Um, I think. All right, so so let, let's say let's say uh, bond ish that side of the pendulum is is zero, Not just because that's you know that's I'm gonna I'm gonna run these numbers one, zero to seven, okay? Mm -hmm. So it, so if bond is on the zero, and then what? Uh, uh, one two three. So three and a half is in the middle. Um, I'm going to say top secret falls somewhere in the five range, maybe maybe pushing on six. It it tends to be very, we we've done everything very believable. I mean, you know what? I'm even gonna, I'm going to go as far as six mm -hmm. because you know like it's it's easy to get killed. Like uh, if you make a make a wrong move, you can die in top secret pretty easily. Um, if you get like for example. Uh, if you look at our weapon damage on some of the weapons, like these really high, you know, like we got an assault rifle. If you take an assault rifle hit at point blank range, the damage is dead. Mm -hmm. That's your damage, dead. So, uh, so it's so it's it's pretty serious in those aspects. And then we also, when when you dig into all the um, the specialties under the trade crafts, they're all like very geared towards spy stuff, and it's all taken from. Um, you know, spy parlance. So we, you know, did a lot of research on, you know, like like how um, spy, like real real world spy, like CIA, FBI. Uh, I know people don't like to call them spies, but they are. Um, 
you know, how, how they do things and, you know, going through some of their, their websites and doctrine and, um, and I work for the, I work for the army, so I have to do security training every year. So I know a lot about, you know, um, uh, a lot of how, uh, counterintelligence, intelligence works. I mean, I'm not an intelligence person, but we have, we all have to do this training anyway. So, so we all get, you know, like how, how to spot counter, you know, how to spot people who are trying to spy on things and trying to compromise you. Um, so we, we, you know, we have a lot of that knowledge base, and we try to Im- import it into the game as much as possible. So it it's pretty realistic. Um, there's not a whole lot of fanciful stuff in it when you go through it. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we, we did have some, you know, spy-like items and stuff, but they're all kind of real-world stuff. Uh, you know, we basically took stuff out of the real world. Um, and, and you'll also notice... When you go through the book, if you look at any of the setting stuff, and this was intentional, this is very intentional. Um, we don't have any kind of mustache twirling super villain organization that is, you know, that is out to like rule the world or whatever. Um, we we did that very much on purpose because that is kind of it's it's fun for stories. It's great for stories. Uh, it's great for movies, um, and 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 obviously it'd be great for for a role playing game. But not for what we were trying to achieve from a, a more realistic standpoint. Um, and, and again, you know that does play back to the. It makes it a little harder for people to run adventures because then it's like you kind of got to do research. Okay, great. Where are these terrorists from, and what is their goals, and and how do I work that into a thing, and what countries do they have access to, and you know, so you have to dig into that kind of stuff. Again, something we need to work to supply to people so that they don't have to do a ton of research just to run an adventure to have some fun with a game. Mm-hmm. And that is a smart move because it, I've seen I've seen pe- some people fall into the certain trap of thinking that they need to account for every aspect of a given literary genre or, fi- or mm-hmm. just genre of fiction and in the process of doing that they end up falling under their own weight. Right. Um, like th- this idea there's it's it's far more it's going to be f- a far stronger result if you pick one particular lane and stick to it instead of trying to do a um omni approach i've seen that with say some people's takes on science fiction and or fantasy but aren't but aren't willing to um they aren't willing to just aren't willing to nail down and instead say oh you can use this for any kind of for any kind of fantasy or any kind of sf or any kind of mo- any kind of modern the problem is that is a very, 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 very wide net to cast. Not only that, but you put a lot of work on your players. So if, if I develop something, it's like you can do anything you want with it. And you know your your customer base. I mean, there, there's going to be some that are like, "Oh, that's great. That's the greatest thing in the world." That's what I was looking for. But more of them, and I know this from experience, more of them are going to go, "Why well, I, I don't want to do anything with it. That's why I bought this. I want you to do all this stuff with it." That's why I'm giving you my money, so I don't have to do stuff. I want to play a game. I want to sit down and play with my friends, and I already have a job and, and stuff to do. I don't I don't want to have to spend, you know, my entire weekend crafting this thing that I had to figure out and do research for, you know, when, you know, I've got another life, you know, I, I don't want to work to play. And so that's one of the things that we've been, you know, very much aware of and like trying to make sure that we're we're covering in the future is giving people a lot of tools so that they don't have to do as much work on their end they can just pick it up and play and have fun yeah and i know that you i know that you recently wrapped, wrapped up a kickstarter that was at that was adding some more modules to top to top secret but mm-hmm. what else do you have what else do you have of um, planned down the road that you can tell me Sure. Yeah. I, yeah. I got. We got some stuff. All right. So we have. Um, well, let me let me talk about the module just just real quick because that does play into to your question. Okay. Because there's um, th- there's the adventure portion of it, which that that's your your module. But when we started developing that, we got into there was a base that everything happens in, and this base kind of grew out of control, um, and it wound up being this giant thing, and it wound up causing this to be a two book set, and the second book is the what's called the crucible which is the base which the game take which the adventure takes place in but the reason why this ties into 
like like you know what else is there for top secret that we're you know we're developing um we did that on purpose to um we instead of scaling it back we leaned into it because that's something you're going to use over and over again this is a this is going to be a resource you're going to keep using after you're done playing the module like you play the module and then you'll have this book and it gives you know, like a base of operations and things for you to train all kinds of stuff can go on and out of there it can be a resource center um and we're going to build off of that so um you know, we've got obviously we've got other adventures planned. Uh, a couple of them, I think we got like two adventures half written, one like three quarters of the way written, uh, another one outlined, um, and then we have um, uh, again working with this guy Scott Congable, one of our really good um, resources. Who's kind of we're kind of sort of bringing him into the fold. He um, he developed this whole book on um, on the trade craft stuff like in how to use trade craft and specialties and it's it's massive it's so much material um which is why we haven't put it out yet because he, he sent it to us and it was you know mostly written but um but you know we, we still have to do like all the formatting and getting it into layout and editing and if there's art you know it's just it's just it's a lot so it's a big chunk of material but it all has to be developed so that's a lot of work, and we already had stuff in the pipeline. But at any rate, you know, coming down the line, there's there's the the tradecraft book, which will be made available some point soon. Um, we're, we're thinking about, you know, Scott just wanted to get it out. He's like, I want people to play with this and use it and stuff. So we're thinking about doing like a beta release of it, to where it's just electronic and it's free. So you'll be able to download the beta version of it and play with it. And like, if you want to like say, hey, I don't like the way this works, and we could talk, you know whatever and then we can like refine it over the next year or so and then release that as a full-on book um we also have uh like i said jason is working he's he's developed some of the um <coughs> um world building stuff you know like so some of the stuff that's going on in the world uh to give you ideas for adventures um i i started working on a document that uh again will be another thing to help um help the the, the administrator and the players create adventures because we found that that's the, the biggest barrier. So a lot of this stuff, I think, is initially going to go out in, like, documents or, or from our website. I mean, that, that's sort of my plan at the moment. I don't know where that's going to go or what that's going to look like just yet. Again, you know, just wrapping up this Kickstarter, trying to get all that done before I start any new projects. But the idea would be to create a space uh, like on our webpage on SolariumGames.com where you could, or either that or TopSecretRPG.com, where you could uh, go to a download section and download some of these beta rules and download some of these documents. And we're also tapping into the fan community because the fans have done a lot. They've done, they've done a whole bunch of documents of stuff that they use for their games. And many of them are like, yeah, sure, you can put up on your website and download them for us. Um, one guy's got like an automated character sheet that helps you like build your character sheets done in Excel and it's beautiful. It's amazing. Um, so you can easily make characters and, and you, know, you know, villains and whatever you want to make. Um, so, so I see over the next year, there being a lot of assets to help, um, people generate their own adventures, um, so they can run campaigns with their, with their players. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll certainly be keeping an eye out on it. But... Yeah. Yeah. With that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here. Yeah, man, thanks for inviting me. It's been a pleasure being here. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As cool. I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>